Domestic violence is one of the most common, harmful and costly forms of violence in Australia. Dealing with a problem like domestic violence or intimate partner violence requires stopping it before it starts and we see this through programs that are targeted at the community and also at high risk um, intervention sites. But it also involves improving the way in which we respond to domestic violence incidents, survivors and offenders when these behaviours are detected by non-government and government systems. So one statutory or government system that has frequent contact with domestic violence victim survivors and offenders are the police. So it's estimated that the police respond to a domestic violence incident uh, every two minutes and information from the Australian Bureau of Statistics suggests that the number of offenders and incidents that police are responding to is increasing year on year. So when we're thinking about how best to improve uh, criminal justice, but particularly policing responses to domestic violence, we really have a couple of questions in mind. So who are the people who are coming into contact with the police? What are the nature of the incidents? And what are the patterns of reoffending behaviour that we are observing? So over the last few years, the Australian Institute of Criminology has undertaken a huge body of research aimed at answering these particular questions. And this has involved the analysis of multiple different data sets taken from different states and territories, particularly police administrative data and police narratives and case file information. So what I wanted to do today is to really go through the key findings from this body of research and really look at what do we now know from an Australian point of view about who comes into contact with the police, what is the nature of domestic violence incidents that are reported to the police, and what is the nature of patterns of domestic violence reoffending being reported to the police. But before I get into that, I think it's probably worthwhile just taking a step back and asking the question, well, why would we focus on reported domestic violence? Because we do know that it really is the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of domestic violence incidents and offenders victim survivors will never have contact with the criminal justice system. So why would we focus on the criminal justice system? Well, as I said, reported DV rates are increasing and the police have frequent contact with victim survivors and offenders. But I think it's also worthwhile remembering that the police often have contact with the most vulnerable sections of our community. So homeless, alcohol and drug abusers, people in social housing and so on and so forth. Um, what we also do know is that the police are probably responding to um, incidents where threat of physical harm are the highest. So they're responding to, at least in the physical violence side of things, more serious incidents. And it's also worth remembering that the police have very, very, a very interesting role, I guess, in responding to domestic violence because they have repeated interactions with the same victim survivors and offenders over an extended period of time. So when we really look at it through that lens, we can really start to kind of understand that the police have a very unique and important role in preventing domestic violence. So what I always say is that even though the police are not responding to the entirety of the domestic violence problem or every aspect of the domestic violence problem, they are responding to a particular problem. And so when we think about how to improve how they respond to that particular problem, we really need the research to underpin those responses. All right, so what did the AIC research program find? So I guess in relation to the first question of who comes into contact with the police, let's start with offenders. So a systematic review that the AIC did of domestic violence research conducted in Australia since 1990 until 2018, identified 39 studies that we could draw upon to actually look at the characteristics of offenders who come into contact with police. And considering that we're talking about almost 30 years of research, there was actually surprisingly little information that we could pull out. But what we can say is that people who are more likely to come into contact with police for DV offending are male, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander overrepresentation. Um, they're typically less uh, than 40 years old and they're generalists. And I'll come back to talk about what a generalist is in a little bit. But something to say about the less than 40 years old, these are just when they come into contact with the police. This isn't about when they start coming into contact with the police or when they're more likely to come into contact with police. It's really just about a point in time assessment. Um, on the unclear side of things, we don't really have a good understanding of the role of socioeconomic status and education and employment status in terms of your likelihood of coming into contact with the police. However, there is some emerging research to suggest that 
particular forms of domestic violence are more likely to be reported by certain sections of the community. So for example, uh, physical violence is more likely to be reported by um, communities with low socioeconomic status, while coercive controlling behaviours are potentially more likely to occur in communities with higher levels of socioeconomic status. But this is one of those big question marks that we really do have around where concentration of reporting is occurring. Another unclear thing at the moment is the role of mental illness, including things like acquired brain injury and alcohol and drug dependence. There is a real lack of research that has looked at these factors in terms of um, increasing or decreasing likelihood of contact with the police. And that's an interesting one, considering that the police are increasingly starting to record this information in a more systematic way. So it seems like to be a really under-researched area. So that's what the research kind of says from the 39 studies we were able to identify. So when we're talking about generalists, well, what is a generalist? Um, in criminological kind of terms, we talk about specialists and generalists. So a generalist is someone who is your garden variety offender who is involved in a bunch of different stuff. So property offending, uh, violent offending, breach of orders, traffic offences, things of that nature. A specialist is someone who predominantly focuses on one area of offending. And in the DV space, there's a lot of kind of ongoing conversation about whether or not domestic violence offenders are specialists. They only ever really engage in, vi in violent behaviours towards their intimate partners. So the analysis of 10 years worth of New South Wales data we got for a domestic violence offender population identified that generalisation is actually very common amongst domestic violence offenders who come into contact with the police. And what that really tells us is that specialisation is very rare within this population and they are likely to be coming into contact with the police for a multitude of different offences. And what we also found is that offenders who had a history of domestic violence offending were more likely to be involved in a large number of other offending behaviours when compared to generally violent offenders and non-violent offenders. So this is an interesting one in terms of looking at the nature of the offending behaviours and where domestic violence kind of sits within the careers of people who come into contact with the police. So just looking at this issue of generalisation <clears throat> using a little bit more of a dated study that we did using Tasmanian data, which really looked at the nature of the other prior offending behaviours amongst domestic violence offen offenders. And this is a bit of a big table and you don't really need to look too closely into it, but what I really wanted to highlight is that as domestic violence offending increases, so too does other offending behaviours. So what you're kind of seeing is this linear relationship between prolific domestic violence offending and prolific other offending behaviours. So what we're really seeing is that there's this cohort of domestic violence offenders who are serious offenders in multiple different domains and are likely to be coming into contact with police on a pretty frequent basis for a multitude of different offences. So back to the New South Wales data, we wanted to look at, okay, so we've been looking at incidents and kind of like, you know, 10 years worth of data. We wanted to really look at when people started their offending behaviours overall. So when were they first coming into contact with the police? And what we identified from this group-based trajectory modelling, which is very complicated, but what you really just need to know is that we pick up people from their time of first offence and we follow them to kind of see what their offending trajectories look like. What we see is that in terms of their first contact with domestic, with, with the police for domestic violence offenders, for domestic violence offending, sorry, um, what we're seeing is that the majority of domestic violence offenders are coming into contact between the ages of 19 and 20. And that kind of correlates with what we understand about people's likelihood to get into serious relationships and cohabitation and things like that. However, this is just a mean age. So this is just taking everyone into one big pool and looking at what's the most kind of like the mean, I guess. But there are standard deviations on either side. And what we do know is that actually one in 10 domestic violence offenders are coming into contact with the police before the age of 19. They're coming into contact with them from the age of 15 upwards. And I'll have a bit more of a chat, a talk about what that kind of means. But something to keep in mind is that we think about domestic violence offenders as being 19, 20 years old. No, we've got a cohort of offenders who are coming into contact with the criminal justice system at a much earlier age. <clears throat> 
Okay, so if you remember back on my previous slide about some of the unclear areas about what we know about domestic violence offenders, one of the big ones for us was we didn't really have an understanding of the role of alcohol and drug dependence and drug use. So what we've done at the AIC is do, is do a couple of interrelated studies looking at specifically the correlation between methamphetamine use and domestic violence. So what we found from our first study, which was just a review of the literature, is that DV is common amongst, amongst methamphetamine users. Um, they account for a small but possibly growing proportion of domestic violence offenders, and it co-occurs with other risk factors. Um, we're not saying that methamphetamine use causes domestic violence, but the most likely kind of, I guess, relationship between the two behaviours is that it exacerbates existing predispositions to violence. So, Taking another study, we looked at data that we had collected through the Drug Use Monitoring in Australia program, and this was what we found. So the Drug Use Monitoring in Australia program collects a bunch of really detailed information about people's drug use histories, and also we included an addenda looking at the domestic violence offending behaviours. So the ones that I really wanted to kind of highlight is that methamphetamine dependence relative to whether you were just a user um, is highly um, correlated with self-reported domestic violence perpetration. So someone who was meth dependent had 3.3 times the odds of someone who was just a meth user generally of being involved in domestic violence perpetration. We also found that minimising attitudes, so minimising attitudes towards violence against women was correlated with self-reported domestic violence as was um, daily alcohol use. What we also did find is that cannabis dependence relative to just using cannabis but not being dependent was also correlated with self-reported domestic violence. So someone who was dependent on cannabis was, had two times the odds of being a perpetrator of domestic violence relative to someone who was just using cannabis. So what we can kind of see here is that there is a relationship between particular drug use and perpetration of domestic violence. So this is something that is really an area for, for future research, I guess. And also has major implications for how we respond to domestic violence offenders. Okay, so on the other side of the equation, we wanted to know, well, who comes into contact with police as victim survivors? So this is again based on a systematic review we did of, Aust of Australian and international studies, which looked quantitatively at who was more likely to report domestic violence to the police. And what we found is that women were more likely, uh, non-white, but this is from US studies. Uh, people who were experiencing frequent violence had experienced prior abuse in other forms of relationships. More serious forms of violence, I put kind of italics around that because it's really related to serious forms of physical violence that we correlate with things like you know, injury, um, choking, non-fatal strangulation, things of that nature whether the offender was using a weapon, whether the offender was intoxicated, and the presence of children witnesses. Mixed or no relationship, again, socioeconomic status related factors around employment and education, relationship status, so it wasn't really clear whether or not it was a former partner or a current partner was correlated with whether or not you were going to report, and whether or not there were children within the relationship. So there's an important point of distinction to be made here. So, Children witnessing the violence was more likely to result in police reporting. Children within the relationship, so having biological children within the relationship between the abuser and the victim survivor, it was unclear whether or not that relationship was statistically significant. So what this kind of tells us is that happily, the people who are most likely to be vulnerable to experiencing significant harm as a result of domestic violence are engaging with the police. So in particular, um, we know that things like weapon use and intoxication are associated with more, I guess, high likelihood of injury and serious forms of physical violence. We also know that women are statistically more likely to experience significant harms as a result of domestic violence. So this is quite encouraging that the people who we would really want to be reaching out to the police are actually reporting to the police. However, on the flip side of that, it's kind of a bit of a well, I take it as a bit of a glass half empty kind of scenario because I'm a bit of a pessimist, is that what we're seeing is that the cohort of, of victim survivors who would potentially benefit the most from early intervention from the police are not engaging with the police. So these are people who um, the violent is infrequent, who have not experienced prior abuse, who are experiencing lower levels of abuse. They're not reaching out to the police. 
And what we do know from the research is that the earlier you intervene in the development of a, of a criminal career, a trajectory of domestic violence offending, the more likely you are to stop it in its tracks. So I guess what this kind of suggests is that the messaging around what domestic violence is, when you call the police, all of those kinds of things, we still need to do a bit of work. Okay, so the next question that we really wanted to answer with the domestic violence research we've been doing is what is the nature of um, incidents that are reported to the police? And it's a really interesting thing that there is a real notable gap in current understanding about the nature of incidents that the police are actually responding to. So much of the research we have done so far is understandably focused on the dynamics of relationships and um, the dynamics between victims and offenders and their contacts with systems over a period of time. And I guess this is related to our current understanding of domestic violence as being a pattern of behaviour that evolves within a relationship over a period of time. However, within that pattern of behaviour, there are discrete incidents and the police respond to incidents. So it is worthwhile actually understanding what's happening in these incidents and what are the potential points of intervention. So what we did is we got a sample of 50 uh, police narratives completed by Tasmanian police officers responding to a domestic violence incident. And we analysed it using crime script analysis. So crime script analysis is a really detailed form of analysis which looks at the procedural aspects of crime. So how did this crime occur in this location and what factors um, increase the likelihood of this offence taking place? So crime script analysis has previously been used for property crimes, so things like theft and burglary and so on. But it is starting to be used for violent crimes like child sex offending, um, terrorism offences, suicide bombing and now domestic violence. So what we really wanted to do was to unpack an incident using a crime script analysis lens. So what we identified is that there are a series of stages that broadly occur within the context of incidents. This is not the case for everyone. This is really just what we most consistently found. Um, so the contact made with victim, conflict, tipping point, violence against victim, de-escalation of violence, end of contact with victim. But then there are all these kind of situation historical preconditions that kind of increase the likelihood of violence occurring. But what I wanted to really highlight is that even within incidents, there are potential points of de-escalation and intervention that could prevent the likelihood of, a, of violent offences taking place. So, for example, half of incidents involved an intoxicated offender um, and the large proportion took place in a public or semi-public place and in front of third parties. So when you actually try to apply our script to a more, um, I guess, crime prevention, uh, using a crime prevention lens, what we can really see is that the, the potential of bystander programs is really heightened within this, um, within this paper. Um, the potential impact of reducing alcohol consumption on, on offenders would be potentially very impactful. And perpetrator programs addressing violent supportive attitudes, impulse control, problem solving, and communication. So one of the questions that we do get when we actually look at incidents is because this is a pattern of behaviour that evolves over a period of time, what's the value in preventing one incident? And I think it's worthwhile remembering that one incident can have a huge impact on victim survivors, families and the community. It only takes one, one incident for a woman or a man to be murdered. It only takes one incident for someone to be choked and to acquire a brain injury. It only takes one incident for someone to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. There is always value in interrupting one incident, even beyond thinking about how interrupting that one incident could have implications for for subsequent offending patterns, which I will go into in a bit. So another study that we did, which was commissioned by the Office for Women's Safety, uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet, uh, looked at women's use of domestic violence within abusive relationships. So the question that we really had was, what are the contextual factors and motivations underlying women's use of violence towards their intimate partners? So what we had was a sample of approximately 150 police narratives provided by New South Wales Police where a woman had been identified as the person of interest and a male as the victim. And we again applied crime script analysis to really understand what was happening within these incidents. And what we found is that violent resistance was very common. So one in two incidents involved violent resistance. So violent resistance is where a woman was responding to the immediately abusive actions of their partners or in the context of prior violence within her relationship. So for example, when we're talking about immediate threat, there were a series of incidents where potentially where 
a woman was being abused or was being threatened by their partner and they used physical violence as a means of um, mitigating that risk. While in many other situations, these are women who had been previously victimised within their relationship by, by the male partner. So these are women who are responding to potentially anticipation of abuse. Okay, so when we dug into these incidents in more detail, we identified something really interesting. So the dark green bars are the incidents involving violent resistance on the part of the woman. So these are incidents where she was responding to the immediate risk of harm posed by their partner. So verbal, verbal abuse, shoving, pushing, things of that nature. So what we identified in those situations, it was very likely that the male would then respond with physical violence and that the woman would be injured. And, but then on the other side of things, what we actually saw is that the threat posed by women was actually potentially not very commensurate or equal to the level of, I guess, force used by the male partner. So what we see is the male victim was not likely to be injured, the female POI was not using a weapon, and the female POI was not intoxicated. So what's another way of kind of thinking about this? So again, it's that the male response to violence was higher than or more significant than the threat actually posed by the women involved. So I guess this adds in a different dimension to understanding the context within which women are using violence. But it really does highlight that in situations where women are using violence, they are still more likely to bear the brunt of the harm associated with domestic violence um, as uh, retaliated by their male partners. Okay, so now let's get into the final question, which is really about what is the nature of patterns of domestic violence offending that are coming to the attention of the police? So we have done a number of studies looking at this. So um, I think it's really interesting. So what we do know is that risk of reoffending is really common amongst domestic violence offenders. So the systematic review that I previously talked about with uh, 39 studies from Australia identified that about one in two will come back into contact with the police pretty, pretty quickly. So we're talking about within about five years, one in two domestic violence offenders will come back into contact with the criminal justice system. So risk of repeat offending is very common. And when we kind of take a different lens on it and we start thinking about what actually hasn't been reported to the police, that number is probably an underestimation. So this is a study that we did in 2015 using Tasmanian data looking at the history of unreported family violence amongst matters reported to the police for the first time. And what we identified of our 97 cases that we were able to code, 30 of them involved a history of unreported family violence. So this was the victim disclosing or a neighbour raising concerns, things like that. So one in two is an underestimate, I guess, in terms of the likelihood of repeat violence. However, risk of repeat violence is not consistent across groups, within people, or even over periods of time. What we know is that it is concentrated. So what we, know is, what we do know is that a small proportion of domestic violence offenders are more likely to re-offend. So there's a small proportion of domestic violence offenders who are accounting for a disproportionate level of re-offending, both in terms of the frequency of offending and also the harm. So some analysis done by Kerr and colleagues in 2017 found that 8% of partners were responsible for 27% of the harm associated with domestic violence. And some research done in Victoria found that 7% of offenders were responsible for 31% of incidents. So risk of reoffending is concentrated within particular um, offenders and offending groups. We also know that domestic violence reoffending is not even constant over time. So I said that one in two will reoffend within about five years. Well, actually, it's very likely if it's going to occur that it's going to happen a bit quicker than that. So this is some survival analysis we did with an adult population from Tasmania. And what we found is that 23% re-offended within, within 180 days. So one in 20 within 14 days, one in 10 within 30 days, and then you see the tail start to kind of decline a little bit. So what this really tells us is that within the, the risk of re-offending is highest within the weeks and months following a contact with the police. So this is for an adult sample. And remember how I said previously that um, even though we know age of onset is on average around 19 to 20 years amongst domestic violence offenders, but that some people are starting earlier. Well, we should be actually pretty concerned. So some analysis that we did looking at adolescent 
um, domestic violence offenders in Victoria identified almost identical reoffending rates. So these are 13 to 18 year olds. And again, what we see is one in four will reoffend within 180 days, one in 20 within 14 days, one in 10 within 30 days. So this is really important because most of what we do in response to domestic violence offending comes into play at 18 years. So this is like men's behaviour change programs, um, going through uh, uh, domestic violence orders, things like that. However, the patterns of offending are potentially becoming entrenched much earlier on for a cohort of offenders and we need to be able to account for that. Okay, so I said the um, risk of reoffending was most likely within the weeks and months following an incident. Well, it was typically peaks around four weeks. So really we're talking about days and weeks following an incident. We need to be putting in strategies that can actually prevent the recurrence of domestic violence. If we get people through a very high risk period, their likelihood of experience for the violence starts to tail off. However, what we also need to recognise is that risk of repeat domestic violence is dynamic as well. So what happens during a period of time following a contact with police actually really does matter. So on one side of it, risk of repeat domestic violence offending increases with every offence. So this is again some analysis we did with some Tasmanian data, which looks at um, multiple offending during a six month period. And what we find is that even though 14% of offenders reoffended within 60 days of that cohort, three in 10 went on to reoffend again within 60 days. And then by the third reoffense, it was 43%. So what we're really kind of seeing here is that by the time the police turn up three times to one household within a 60 day period, the likelihood that they're going to turn up again pretty quickly is almost the flip of a coin. So this really does demonstrate the cumulative risk associated with reoffending amongst domestic violence offenders. But related to this as well is that what we found is that the timing of the first reoffense was really important for predicting the nature of your subsequent reoffending. So the quicker you reoffend once you've had contact with the police, the more likely you are to reoffend again more quickly and also reoffend multiple times. So this ties in really nicely with the stuff that we've done around incidents of domestic violence about the importance of preventing one incident could have not only major implications for the safety of victims and families and communities at that point in time, but also in the future. You could be interrupting patterns of behavior that are emerging or that are entrenched. Okay, so what I wanted to kind of wrap up with a little bit is around who is likely to reoffend. So this is based on some research that we did in the Australian Capital Territory. Um, the ACT policing had implemented a risk assessment tool and we were asked to validate it effectively. And this is some work that was done by my colleagues, Chris Dowling and Anthony Morgan. So what they found from their analysis of 350 cases is that there were 10 risk factors that were highly correlated with likelihood of reoffending within a short period of time, so six months time. So these were characteristics related to the nature of the incident that came to the attention of the police, but also prior offending behaviours and characteristics associated with the individual themselves. So things like the offender had assaulted the victim during the most recent incident, the offender has injured or threatened to injure, to injure a family pet an hour in the past, Victim was physically injured. There is a pregnancy on new birth, which we can probably understand because pregnancy is very significantly correlated with both the escalation and onset of domestic violence behaviors. The offender has breached a protection order or any court, court order now or in the past, which really kind of highlights that thing of they're not responding to traditional criminal justice responses to domestic violence. And the offender has money problems at the moment, which is a situational risk factor. So these factors were very highly correlated with likelihood of reoffending within a six month period. So what we do know is that most states and territories currently have risk assessment tools that are aimed at identifying who is likely to reoffend. At the moment, it seems like the revised FV RAT in the ACT is the most ri rigorous and valid, and that's based on the 10 risk items. However, when we're talking about who is likely to reoffend, most of our research so far has been focused on prevalence. So who is likely to reoffend at all? However, there is another dimension of reoffending that we haven't really touched on yet, but we're aiming to over the next however long is around escalation. So who is likely to reoffend but be perpetrating serious forms of violence at time of contact with the police. 
This risk assessment tool, those 10 risk, item, risk items do not tell us who is likely to be a serious reoffender, only who is likely to reoffend. However, the FVRAT does include red flags, which are correlated with likelihood of serious violence. And these are things like sexual violence within the relationship, prior choking behaviours, and so on and so forth. But this is just something that we really need to be mindful of, is that when we're talking about reoffending, there are multiple different dimensions of reoffending that we need to be cognizant of. So this is just a bit of a kind of a toot toot because we've done so much work in this space, but we've done a lot and it's all publicly available through the ARC website. So everything that I've just spoken about is publicly available and accessible for free download on the ARC website. We've also got a Twitter handle, AIC Criminology, and we have a Facebook page. So you should check us out because we do put notifications up about all our new and upcoming releases. So hopefully this has been enlightening in terms of understanding who comes into contact with the police, who, what the nature of those incidents are and the patterns of reoffending. So thank you for your time. <laughs>